All right, so today we're gonna stop, oh, today we're gonna do a bit less interaction with turtles because we gotta, because I gotta focus on something a bit more abstract, which is uh, Boolean expressions. Uh, I'm going to show you more, compl uh, more complex Boolean expressions, and I'm also going to show you uh, some basic sequences. Uh, I'm also going to finally do chapter five, which is basic sequences, and I'll sign readings for that. Um, we're just going to address what some sequences are. Primarily, we're going to deal with strings and lists in the class, although other ones exist, like tuples. And, but for the most part, we deal with strings and lists, which are fairly straightforward to de deal with. So let's go ahead. And right now, we aren't really using too many variables and stuff. It's mainly we're just learning a lot of concepts, and we're going to do multiple passes so we can put it together. Right. Uh, furthermore, I should probably mention that um, I will probably give our first exam not next, not next week because I like to give way more than a uh, lead up of a week. Not next week, but the week after. Since this is week three, I do like to generally give it on week five. It will be in lecture uh, when we give it, so most likely on a Thursday of week five or the Tuesday of week six, depending on uh, how I feel this class, uh, how far I've gotten through material. I will. Um, now that may send you into a, a, you know, into a panicking sweat to hear that, but not to worry. I will be giving you a practice exam. Now the practice exam, how, how does that get created? I give you, so what I do is I make twice as many questions as I need. I throw half of them in the practice exam, half of them in the actual exam. There you go. So I could either give you the practice exam or the actual exam as your actual exam. But, you know, either one could have ended up being your actual exam. But, and a lot of times the questions, they use a lot of the same concepts and things. Uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes the given code for one question becomes like, gets adapted and turned into a fill in a blank on the actual exam. So, you know, there's things that go on there. Um, the exam is on paper. Now, this may seem strange because you've got this programming code. But the reason for that is that, you know, if you're trying to test your code and run it, there's basic mistakes that can just simply mess up your day, right? Like forgot a colon, forgot to indent properly. I called it X up here. I called it X up here, but I in the loop. You know, things like that. Um, so it allows. So I, it allows me to basically just kind of allows you to write your code a bit faster and allows us to overlook some mistakes. But a lot of the stuff for this first exam will be pretty basic. Um, and after this first exam, we'll see how often we need to do an exam, but you'll always have at least a week's notice um, about that. So it will either be on, um, not next week, right? That's week four. It's a bit too soon. But it will either be on the 13th or the 18th. Okay? 13th or the 18th. Thursday the 13th, an unlucky day indeed, right? All right. So let's talk about um, what's yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna aim to do at least I'm gonna aim to do three exams plus the final. That's my goal. So the first one happens at five weeks, and I'm gonna try to aim about like week nine for the for the second exam, and then week uh, and then closer to the final for the last exam. Because the thing about the exams is that. They are a large part of the grade, but having more of them helps do that. And plus, I can make the first exam a bit easier if I know that I'm going to be covering more stuff in later exams. So, you know, I can definitely handle the basics. I'm trying to also go, again, slower this semester in terms of the material. So it does mean that I'll have to rewrite my exam. It's a pain in the butt <laughs> to, to, to write exams, let me tell you, because the I got two choices. I can write ones that are easy to uh, easy to write, but then they become hard to grade. And then I can write ones that are easy to grade, but they take forever to write. Good multiple qu choice questions take forever to write. So, um, let's see. Generally, I also I don't make them open note, but I do give you a cheat. But you are allowed a cheat sheet. So one page, cheat sheet, front and back, regular size paper. 
um, and however you want it, and however you want to put stuff on that cheat sheet, you can put stuff on the cheat sheet, right? So if you want it handwritten, sure. You want it printed, sure. You want to write half of it in red and half of it in blue and bring in 3D glasses, sure. So um, I'm not really too concerned is because the process of making the cheat sheet is actually very, very valuable, okay? Um, also generally on exams, I give a buffer of five points. So there's 105 points on the exam, but your score is out of 100. So there's like five extra credit points baked in, which means you can miss 15 points and still get an, a, a raw 90. So. All right. So let's go ahead and get started with um, a, a Boolean expressions, right? We saw that, that we had Boolean expressions like this uh, yesterday. Like print, three is greater than seven. Print, um, you know, six equal equals uh, five, or six equals equals six. We also, um, one thing I didn't show yesterday is that there is a not equal, there is a raw not equals, which uses the exclamation point. So false, this is true, six is equal to six, and then six not equal to six, right? That's kind of how you would type it out anyway, so that makes sense. Um, but what we have to, but one of the things we need to know about uh, statements is that, um, about these Boolean expressions is that it's not just these, uh, these operations we do. Um, we've got two other operations, the and and or operators, and they can be a bit tricky. So and is basically takes two of these Boolean expressions and it will return true if uh, both of them are true. So if weather, so let's go and put weather equals raining over here. And let's see. Let's see, um, and I'm trying to think of something good to do. So if, let's just go ahead and start. If weather equal equals rain, uh, if weather is equal to raining, ah, there we go. And now, let's go ahead and do temperature is less than, let's do temperature is equal to 45. Uh, let's do whatever. If weather equal equals raining and temperature is less than 60, print, bring a raincoat. Okay, so these are two, se uh, these are two independent if statements, right? They, they are independent because there's no else's that connect them, right? There's no else if. So if one is true, it doesn't preclude the other from being true as well, right? They can both be true, they can both be false. One can be true, one can be false. Okay, so if weather's raining, bring an umbrella, and if weather is raining and temperature is less than 60, bring a raincoat. Makes sense. Bring a raincoat. Now, the and statement connects two Boolean expressions together. So if weather's raining and the temperature is less than 60, it will ru run. But if neither of them is true, sorry, if one of them is not true, then it won't do anything, right? So weather sunning is if weather. So I said the weather is sunny. If the weather is raining, bring an. We don't print out bring an umbrella because the weather is sunny. Furthermore, the weather is is sunny. So now, so now, right over here, we have a check. If the weather is raining and the temperature is less than sixty, 
The temperature being less than 60 is true, right? This part is true. But the weather being raining, that's false. So for an AND statement to evaluate to true, and I'll just simply print this out over here. Um, for an AND statement to evaluate to true, both sides of an AND statement have to be true. Right? Makes sense? Both things have to be true for it to be true. Otherwise, it's going to be false. If both things are false, they're going to be, it's going to be false. So if it's, say, 75 and sunny, which is wonderful weather, um, hope we get that weather so sooner rather than later, um, then notice that it's still false, even though both conditions are false. Just because the conditions match on both sides doesn't make it true. It's only true if both things are true, right? Does that make sense? Okay, let's see if I can't add another factor into this. Um, boop, boop. So if weather equal, equals raining and temperature is greater than is, let's see. And temperature is greater than 60. Oh, sorry. Temperature is greater than 90. Hmm. I'm trying to think of something else. Hmm. What else can I, what other factor can I add? What other kind of decision? Wind. Wind? Hmm. Wind. What would I, was I? The month? Maybe, but I'm just trying to, s I like, hmm, I'm just trying to think of a good example for three and statements, but might as well not stretch it. So I'm going to go ahead and go, uh, go a bit abstract over here. Then, um, oh, and, ah. So here we go. If, um, have boots is equal to false. All right, so if weather is equal to raining and temperature is greater than 90 and let's go ahead and, and not have boots. So, did a lot over there. <laughs> Print. Looks like sandals for today. Pretty sure you, how do you spell sandals anyway? Sandals, that didn't look right. There we go. All right, so if the weather is raining and the temperature is greater than 90 and not have boots. So first off, not have boots, right? Have boots is false. So the not will flip the false to true, right? Right, the not affects directly in front of it. So you can think of it, in fact, you can write it if you prefer like this. Right, you can you can totally put parentheses around this just to make things uh, make sure things execute in a certain order, if you need to. But with an and, it really doesn't matter which of these execute first. Right, all three have to be true for the entire statement to be true, even though it's going to evaluate only two at a time. It's only going to evaluate one pair at a time. But if a single pair is false, right, the entire thing's going to be false. Right. So here, I'll run it. Boom says. Let's see, uh, not have boots, temperature's greater than 90, so let's go ahead and increase the temperature to 91, make it raining. Bring an umbrella, looks like sandals for today. Now, um, if I set the temperature, to, if I set it to be um, sunny, now this is not something you're gonna see uh, happen uh, in, in Python, because it happens behind the scenes. 
But the first thing I che it checks is that weather is equal to raining, right? Um, and Python's fairly smart. The interpreter's fairly smart. It says, oh, this and this and this. Well, I immediately hit a false. I'm not going to, what it th will do is that it's not even going to bother looking at the other two. Uh, that's a feature called short circuit circuiting. Uh, just hold it in the back of your mind until next semester when you get to Java, if you're taking Java next. Um, because in languages like Java and C, you can do stuff in the middle of an if statement check, which is bad programming practice. So, and, it, and, and if it's short circuit, something, that means that it won't execute that check. But anyway, just know that, it, that basically, know that it, it's going to be efficient and just like you, if it, could stop if it can stop doing the checking, it's going to be lazy and stop doing the checking when it can. Okay, so the and statement is, um, is, pretty, is pretty nice. Um, let's go ahead and take a look. at one more thing. Going to the beach equals true. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna go and put this in, keep this expression in parentheses for right now. This means this all executes together, right, as kind of one clause, right? Okay, or going to the beat. Now notice that I'm not saying, I, I, I'm skipping the whole going to the beach equal equals true. Because this is a true or false statement, I can just skip that entirely and just simply say, or it's going to the beach, or going to the beach, right? And it will just simply, they will ask, what is going to the beach? Is it, oh, it's true, okay. So let's go ahead, and it's sunny right now. Temperature is greater than that, but sunny. So this will all evaluate to false, while this will evaluate to true. So we've got this OR operator over here, and we're going to see what happens. One side of the OR was false. The other side of the OR was true. Looks like sandals for today. So the OR operator is kind of a bit of the reverse of the AND operator. If either side is true, or both sides are true, the entire thing is going to evaluate to true. It is not the exclusive or. Do you want to go uh, shopping or do you want to go to the movies, right? Do you want to um, do you want to have uh, do you want to go out to eat for dinner or do you want to stay home to eat for dinner? Those are exclusive ors, and that is typically the way we linguistically use an or, right? To exclude one uh, one thing or another. Um, in Python, we sometimes call, oh, sorry, in programming, we sometimes call that the ZOR, or XOR, for exclusive OR, um, which is useful sometimes, but we don't really need it uh, here. So um, here, because going to the beach was true, it didn't matter that it wasn't raining or that it, that it was sunny. Going to the beach kind of overrode that. Now, interesting thing to note, um, this doesn't happen that often, um, but the it looks like that the um, let's see. So there's an order of operations for um, for in Python, Python and or precedence, right? Which one gets executed first? Expressions. There's all sorts of, um, let's see, Boolean? Um, let's see, logical. No. There's a Python operator precedence. There we go. Should be a table on one of these. There we go. So uh, there's a whole order of operations, right, besides your, um, besides our, you know, 
plus then, minuses, and all that. And a lot of this you can ignore, like the bitwise stuff. What that does is that those are b operations that, those are binary operations, right? Operation, like, they're, just like modulo is a special operation, right? Just like, um, you know, doing multiplication, division, and remainder is its own operation. These are their own special operations, like you see, the, you know, the kind you see made up on like the SATs or something like that, okay? Except these aren't made up. We, we do have a, a, a use for these um, because we're dealing with a bi binary system, but you don't particularly have a use for them. These, in, not in, is, is not. We're going to look at the in when we look at, uh, at comparisons, but notice that all the logical operators, they happen after our math operators, which makes sense, right? You never really think about it, right? And now you're worried you have to memorize it, but you don't. You just have to, you know, think intuitively, um, which is that, oh, wait, um, if I say, hey, is 3 plus 5 greater than 4 plus 2, right? It's not going to go 3 plus 5 greater than 4 plus 2, right? It's not going to go, hey, is 8 greater than 4 and then add 2 to true? No, it's going to do what you would expect to do in math, which is that you'd simplify each side. You'd ask if 8 was greater than 6, right? And that's intuitive. Hopefully, that's how you would intuitively look at that, right? So Python's meant to, and other programming languages are meant to do that. Um, however, if you're unsure, if you're ever, ever, ever unsure of, how, of, of the order that things should be executing in, okay? And trust me, I'm, I do this all the time, it's a, and I've been programming for a while. Just throw parentheses around it because nothing beats parentheses for making sure that things order uh, operate in the order you want them to, right? These two statements are equivalent. This isn't one, one of those, oh, now watch what happens if we use parentheses instead. This, I'm just saying that there's no such thing as, it really, the, I, I don't ever view parentheses as unnecessary um, if you're using them to make sure you're being explicit and making sure there's not going to be a mistake. Now, the only thing I really want to, I didn't realize how, glare, how much glare there was. The only thing, I really wanted, hold on, I'm going to look to see if there's any way, it, can I improve the lighting at all? Is that better? Yes? Okay. So, hate it being dark, but I also want you to be able to see. So, notice that ands execute before ors. So, this all those ands execute before the ors execute. So, um, however, are you going to remember this rule? No. Does the guy with the PhD who's sitting in front of this class ever remember this rule? No. So you're going to do what the guy with the PhD did earlier, which is that he put parentheses around it. So if you're ever if you're mixing your ands and ors, and that's very rare to mix your ands and ors, by the way. Very, very rare. Just throw parentheses around it to make sure you, you, want, you know that things are going to execute the way they're going to execute. Um, OK. Um, so on the exam, I'll go ahead and tell you about what I do about for around 15 points of the first exam. Let's see, it's like 15 or 20 points uh, for the first exam are basically, as, are basically evaluating expressions. Ten of those points will be evaluating mathematical expressions, like asking you to, like here's one that I al almost always ask, just with different numbers. Don't you like that? I'm telling you what's going to be on the exam. Okay, so here's two questions, um, one of which I always, let me, sorry. I just always ask these with different numbers. So um, I will ask you what is the difference between these operations? Uh, 7 divided by 2, I'll ask you what the difference between, just, you know, it'll be different numbers. I'll almost certainly be dividing by 2 here, though. 
the difference between 7 divided by 2, 7 divided divide by 2, and 7 mod 2, right? I'm always asking you the different, you know, to give me the difference between those three different operations, right? And if you're, and div divide 2, right, that gives you a float, right? 7 divide 2 gives you a float. 7 divide divide 2 gives you integer. So we just throw out that point. And 7 mod 2, that means 7 give me the remainder of 7 divide by 2, which is just 1. Oh, or syntax error because I have a space in front of it. There we go. That's something that we do a lot, that, we, that I will almost always give. Another one I like to give is something along the lines of, of, of this. Let's see. And I do not allow calculators on the exam, so this should be the fact that you'll see this on the exam is a big hint. Um, ba -ba -bum. So, so let's see. Uh, 556, right? What, what's that? Anybody want to do that in their head? Zero, Zero. right? All right, uh, let me do another one, another simpler one, uh, another one that I like to do. Um, let's do 2002 divided by 2001. What's that? 556, because to, this is this number divided by this number. This number is more than one number than this number by. Sorry, this number is less than this number by one. So it can only go into this number once, right? So it'd be one point some god awful number. But we don't have to worry about the god awful number, right? We just throw it away because it's worthless to us. And so one times something, well. <laughs> That's like, you know, this is are you smarter than uh, fifth grader kind of stuff. So, um, in the once it reduces down, so um, there it's not so much that there's that they're trick questions in the sense that I do try to emphasize, hey, the math is never that really that hard, and I do care about. Um, about basically understanding how division works, right? I do want you to understand how an integer division works because it's very essential for that, okay? So that's first 10 points. Other 10 point, 10-ish 10 points is around, five to 10 points is evaluating Boolean expressions. And I typically just do five of those. So just can you evaluate things to true and false? And we're gonna be getting into that. Um, because there's very little interesting stuff I can do here. So, um, so I want to talk about sequences now. Because now that once we start with doing sequences, we can start combining that with our if statements and our for loops and other things. Okay. Ah, now sequences are the bread and butter because right now the way we've been dealing with stuff is that we can throw a single thing into a variable. Right? This goes... Sorry, x is equal to a bunch of stuff. X is equal to a single number. But there's issues with with using with basically using just one variable to hold only one thing, which is that sometimes you want to hold a lot of things in a variable. So there's two big sequences that we're going to talk about. The first is one that we've already that we already know, which is strings. Um, now, in other programming languages, there's two different kinds of text. There's characters and there's strings. Fortunately, you're taking Python, so there's just strings. Um, and what a string is in other languages is that it's just a giant array of characters. It's a giant list of characters. Um, now, Python, we're gonna, because, we, because we have been exposed to strings, we're going to talk about strings first before we talk about lists. But it turns out just about everything I'm going to be talking about here works for lists as well. They, strings and, and lists in Python, it's amazing. They use the same notation. It's wonderful. 
other languages really need to pick up on that because it's a big pain in, a pain in the neck otherwise. You know, I want to use a bit stronger language there, but I do try to keep a certain amount of professionalism. So, a string is a collection of a bunch of characters. Now, characters, um, now there is this wonderful video I suggest you watch um, at some point. Computer file, um, he has a bunch of co oh, cool stuff. It's a YouTube channel. Um, you know, YouTube's terrible except for a couple of different spots like Crash Course, Computer File. A lot of the educational stuff on YouTube is top notch. Um, oh, look, one on regular expressions. Came out two days ago. That's pretty awesome. Um, this one, I think, what is it? I was, I was just talking about, right, Unicode. I was just talking about this. So there should be one on Unicode. Characters, symbols, and the Unicode uh, uh, miracle. This is a great video on how on basically um, how computers encode information. And I'm going to go over the basics right now, um, which is that essentially uh, language used to be very Anglophone centric in the uh, in computer programming, which is the sense that we assumed that everybody would be typing in English. Uh, that's a terrible assumption. So, um, and as such, we built our systems using something called ASCII. ASCII is the American Standard Code for information uh, for information exchange. So, when we were talking about ASCII art, that's what ASCII was. It encodes thing. It encodes characters. What does that mean? It means that your computer, remember, is a rock that we tricked into thinking using electricity. It only understands ones and zeros, high amounts of electricity and small amounts of electricity. It doesn't understand words, or at least not naturally. It has to take those in the same way that basically we take in our information and then it, those, get uh, those get processed by our ears and, and get shot through, our neur uh, through neurons, um, you know, and those get, I don't know the a correct uh, neurobiologic, uh, the neuro neuroscience terms for those, but essentially those messages propagate in our brains, and that probably gets encoded in something other than A, B, C, D, or E. Uh, computers will just encode stuff in ones and zeros. Uh, so we use ones and zeros to encode all of these different things. Um, now, what we use is. Um, ASCII is, uses seven bits, which is one short of a byte. A byte is the basic unit is the basic unit in computing, pretty much. I mean, you can deal with individual bits, but your computer only deals with stuff in bytes. A byte is eight bits, eight binary digits. In other words, it's a number between zero and two fifty-five inclusive, up to but not including two fifty-six, right? Two to the eighth power. Now we use seven of the bits. Uh, the initially they were using just seven bits for some reason, um, so that gives us 128 different characters. Okay, and these 128 different characters are the ones we pretty much rec. Uh, some of them are actually ones we don't recognize, but we use anyway. So null is a bunch of zeros. Character one start of heading. Character two start of text. Character three start of text. Character four end of transmission. Ah, this one, number seven. Uh, that's Bell, which um, basically, if you ever, if you ever remember your com those computers that do beeps when you boot them up, and, and the beep seems to come from the computer itself when you hear the squeaks, boop, beep, beep. That's that's because there's a computer speaker attached to the uh, motherboard there, a tiny one, and that I believe this is what will activate it. The Bell character. Ring a small extra um, mechanical bell on tickers or teleprinters or tel typewriters to let them know that something is coming through. Um, a lot of this is just a bunch of nonsense that we'll never that we'll never use. These are non-printable characters. Now the printable character is the one we talk about. Zero. If your computer sees zero one zero 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 zero, which translates to thirty two in decimal, um, then that's your space character. That's somebody hitting space on the keyboard. In fact, 
if you hit space on the keyboard right now, the way it works is that it just generate it is that your keyboard sends the number 32 in binary to uh, to the motherboards and it will pick up on that and it's and it will translate that into space okay um, bang or exclamation point quotation mark our pound symbol or hash um, dollar sign you'll note that this is a very Ameri uh, um, kind of American centric um, you know coding American, I mean, it's American standard code. So, but we've got our parentheses, all the symbols we can use. And then 65 is capital A, 66 is capital B, 67 is capital C, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, there were some revisions, but for slash, brackets. So all the A's through Z's and A through Z's are encoded a bit differently. Okay. Okay. Um, now, eventually this was extended into Unicode, which says, uh, well, actually, if we want to act, actually type stuff out um, in more than just English and say in Japanese, which has three separate uh, alphabets, or, or rather not alphabets, but symbols sets, right? You've got your kanji, your hiragana, and your katakana all have different uses. Um, and there's over... 2,000 official kana uh, or kanji, yeah, and then I mean, and then I don't know how many if uh, how many different Chinese characters there are, but there's a lot. You know, suddenly eight bits is insufficient. So Unicode is what we've is basically extended that. Um, as you can see, predominant national selected minority scripts. Like, you can do stuff with the Latin alphabet. You can, but it extends uh, ASCII. Now, why am I bringing this up? Well, we've got a cool function here, which basically will translate for us, right? I mentioned that uh, capital A um, is, has the value of 65. ORD gives us the computer code. For, it gives us the Unicode value for that, 65, right? Ord, I suppose that's just short for ordinal. Um, space, remember that was like 32 I said? Boom, 32. Okay. Um, and we can kind of combine this, CHL. Um, and we can take a number, by the way like 97 and say give me the character that has the equivalent value of, ni of ni give me the character that corresponds to 97 that's lowercase a by the way I know this because uh, from memory because I've dealt with encryption enough that which is like a little bit to remember that oh right um, 97 is negative a ask me for any of the uh, or 97 is a ask me for any of the other letters I won't tell you I can just tell you that 97 is lowercase a um, but we can also kind of do something like this. Uh, so ORD, we can kind of combine these. ORD of A plus 3. C and then if I throw a CHR around all that, right, a function calling a function. It seems scary, but remember, we go inner first, right? ORD of A, that's 97, plus 3 which gives me 90, sorry, sorry, gives me 100. Effectively, this is saying, give me the letter that's three after A. Oops, takes, ah, I pressed enter. So what happened there? I pressed enter while I had something highlighted it, so it replaced it with a new line. That was stupid of me. So, CHR, ORD, 97, plus three, give me the thing that, I'm sorry, A plus three, give me the number, th give me what's three letters after A, D. All right, so what about other stuff? Uh, what about the character that corresponds to 324? 
So that's something. It's uh, N with an accent on it. Character of 5300. Oh, well, that's a weirdo. I don't know what that is. Um, I don't even know what character set I'm in at that point. Um, but you can basically take any character. And, um, you can take any kind of, let's see, 32. You can take any kind of character, uh, sorry, any kind of character and get its number. And you can take these numbers and see what their corresponding character is, which is pretty cool. Um, THR7. That doesn't really produce much because it's one of those unprintable characters, so it's just telling me it's unprintable. Um, but a character, so anyway, what a string is, is that it's made up of a, at least one of these individual number, of these individual things. Each of these, sim, each of these A's, Essentially, this comes down to this is 90, the AAA is 97 followed by 97 followed by 97. That's how your computer encodes it. Do you have to remember that? No, it's just kind of useful to know. That's what it's doing underneath the surface. What's important to remember is the real, but the important thing to get out of that is that each of those characters is an individual, each of those strings is an individual string. And we can address it as such. So let's go with word is equal to, um, I'm going to go with world because it has unique letters. So I can use something called subscript notation to um, get individual characters out of it, right? Um, if you've ever had to deal with matrices, right? And I'm going to have to draw on the board for a second. Oh, actually, somebody left uh, something. Uh, something similar for me right over here, right? Uh, so we've got equations up on the board for liquid and gas stuff. I don't know. I'm not a chemist. Uh, be not. You can't produce this very easily in monospace text, can you? Right? In fact, anything with an exponent, you, you can't really produce that easily, right? Uh, so if I were to do 73 squared, right? In Python, we don't or you aren't able to do superscript. Right? We do 73, you know, uh, star star 2 to do that. Similarly, if you're just typing stuff out on, uh, in your notes, a lot of times you're just going to do 73 carat 2. Right? 73 carat 2 to visually represent that that's supposed to be superscript. Similarly, for matrices and stuff, we have subscripts. Right? Suppose I have this matrix A over here. I'm going to make a very boring matrix. Okay? Um, the matrix A is equal to five, two, seven, three. Right? And then I could say if I want the first item in here on a matrix. I would say a sub 1, right, to get that. Now, mind you, in computer science, we like to start things from 0. So when we're dealing with computer science stuff, you're just going to have to mentally change modes and say, if I want to get a0 would give me 5. a1 would give me 2. Uh, a2 would give me Seven. Make sense? So start from zero. So you'll be starting from zero when counting stuff. But just like I can't do superscripts, I can't do subscripts. But we have a notation, just like putting a caret would uh, up, kind of visually signifies um, in how. So like a caret visually signifies in your notes, superscript. Or star star for us represents exponentiation. We have, we have a notation. So word world zero. That's the superscript. That's our subscript notation there. This says, give me the first thing in word. This only works for our sequences or collections of stuff. Right? Gives me w. 
So give me the thing, uh, the second thing. Now that gets a bit confusing, the first thing at zero, the second thing at once. So instead we refer to things as indices or index. So give me the thing at index zero, which is W. Give me the thing at index one, okay? What about index four? What's index four? Anyone? D. 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 All right. So fortunately, this subscript notation, where basically zero is the first thing, and then n minus one, where n is the size of the thing, um, is the last thing. That's true. That's pretty much true for pretty much every single programming language I've worked with, except for MATLAB which is an engineering programming language. And MATLAB likes to start at one because it's meant for engineers and it's really good at matrices. And so they keep it in using mathematical notation. Uh, for this, why do we start at zero? It has to do with like memory management uh, for, with, with the way that things are internally stored and, and address and figuring out where, uh, basically internally figuring out where everything is. You'll probably learn more about that in, in hardware. It's not something I want to introduce into this class. It's something I would, in, I would introduce in Java or data structures when we actually talk about memory locations. Not in this class, not in a beginner thing like this, no. Uh, not right now, at least. Not in the third week. Okay, so, um, so we can use this to get um, our individual letters. Um, now, this also gets us into a very common error that you're going to be making. Um, not intentionally, though, like I'm about to do, which is, what is word 5? And it will tell me an index error. This is a very common error. Tells you, And it says, the string index is out of range, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Those are, in, are the appropriate indices, right? It's five letters long, so the indices are up to, z they start at zero and go up to, but don't include five. Makes sense? It's five layers long, goes up to, but not include five. There's a theme going on here, a very consistent theme of going up to, but not including a certain amount. And that's because we start at zero. So if we try to do this, we get an error. If we try to go out of bounds, doesn't matter how near or far out of bounds it is, it's going to just tell us it's too far. Now, okay. Now here is something really cool about Python. And if you're coming in from a different language, you better pay attention right now. Okay. In other languages, doing this is out of bounds. But in Python, this is a really, really cool feature. Negative one gives me the last uh, letter. That's cool. Right? Oh, and uh, let's extrapolate a bit. Uh, what's this? So the word is world. So what is negative 2 going to be? Yeah, whatever, whatever it ends with, right? L. Yeah, it doesn't start from 0 that way. So it's very useful to go backwards like that. So that's really cool and really useful. Um, you would be... Um, because a lot of times you want to get the last thing. And in other programming languages, I'd have to do, if I want to get the last thing, I have to write this annoying expression, which is going to look super intimidating, right? If I didn't have that, I'd have to write this. Uh, word, len, len word, minus one. And that looks scary, doesn't it? Looks nasty. Looks awful. It's what I have to do in every single other freaking language. But in Python, I just get to say negative one, which is awesome. Now that brings into me to an, uh, to another thing, a new function, right? Chr and o -O -O -R -D, I, I, I should mention you're probably not going to see on the test. But if I decide to put them on the exam, I am going to give me one second to pull up a, a practice exam from last semester because I want to just be very clear about. Um, uh, about something I do. Um, do to do, do not classroom teaching. 
practice. So here's the practice final from last semester. Okay. Front, front page of all exams and practice exams look like this. Second page, useful notes, where I list things that I find, think you'll find useful. And one of the things I list there is what length does, right, which I'll, I'm about to go over, but a bunch of other things. If, so if I include ORD and CHR in the exam, I will tell you what they do on the second page, just in case you forgot about them, because I kind of just went over them really quickly. So uh, useful notes, always have useful notes on this exam, um, because I don't want you to be because I care, because really it's, this class isn't about memorization, it's about problem solving. And if you're missing a piece of data, I want you to have it. Okay? So, let's go ahead and, now, length of anything. So given a sequence or any, anything that's a collection of stuff, it can tell you how big it is. Length of word is five here. Now remember, word is world. Five letters in it. So if I instead change wor word to, I'm going to go ahead and say uh, text instead to let make it less confusing. Text is equal to hello, comma, world. Okay. Hello, world. We can print, um, if I, if I ask for the length of the text, it gives me 12. Now, you'll notice that there's only 10 letters, right? Hello and world. But it gives us 12. And that's because is we've got a comma and a space. It's not giving us the number of letters. It's giving us the number of characters, right? The number of keystrokes that were actually typed in to produce this. Make sense? Okay. Um, now... This works again for any for this will work again for lists, which are fairly simple, which are fairly straightforward, um, and it will also work for tuples and map, maps and dictionaries. It works for basically anything. Um, and again, I'm just going to harp on. Unlike so, you have one thing that tells you how big everything anything else is, and this sounds. This may not sound too exciting, but to me, I work in Java a lot. And Java, you use dot length to figure out the length of an array. You use dot length with parentheses to figure out how big a string is. And you use dot size for, with parentheses for everything else. Why? Because, I, I don't know, maybe the, maybe the developers of Java had it out for students. Um, but, um, so for Python to have one thing, and that works on everything, that's great. Sorry, I kicked out my um, charger because it's right by my feet. Great design there. Um, so uh, strings are fairly awesome. Um, and also, they are objects just like the turtles were objects. So we can do stuff with them. Um, but, I need to inf but before we talk about what we can do with them, I need to talk about what you can't do with them which is different than what, we, what, what you'll see what we can do with lists. What you can't do with this is, is that you can't change a string. You can never, ever, ever change a string. Um, this is not like, and if you do it, your computer will explode. I'm just saying that it's impossible to do. Um, this is a, this is what, strings are what we call immutable objects. So, for instance, I can get the first letter like this, but I can't do this. Let's see, actually. So, but if I do this, it says that this does not imp uh, uh, do assignment. We'll see that we can do this with lists, but we can't do this with strings. You can't change a string. And so anything that I'm going to be doing in the next 20 minutes that looks like I'm changing a string, it's not going to be changing a string. What I'm doing is that, or what Python's doing, is that it's creating a new string and handing it to me. Okay? You can't change a string, but you can use a string to generate more, st more strings. So, um, what kind of cool things do we have for um, strings? 
let's see. So text dot, I think, uh, to upper. Let's see. Upper. Is that a function? Yeah. Text dot upper. Makes it all shouty case. Um, and then, so let's save that in a, in a new string. Text, all caps, is equal to text dot upper. Right? I can also do, if there's an upper, you can bet that there is a lower. Text dot lower. Not lover, lower. Here we go. Let's go ahead and there's one other one that's kind of unique to Python, I feel. Uh, Python string docs, right? So whenever you want to know something about, that's inside Python, just do Python, the thing you want to know about, and docs. Not D-O-X as in doxing a person, but D-O-C-S as in documentation. Um, common string operations. So let's go ahead and see. Um, do do do. So, cap it tall. Yep. Capitalize. That's what I thought. Um, and this one's a very neat, neat one. Text dot capitalize. Upper and lower, you'll probably you'll use at some point. Capitalize, you're never going to use, but it's useful to know what it does, which is that it just capitalized it. Um, let's see if I say text is equal to um, hello dot, sorry, hello world. So text dot capitalize. Whoops. And you got to remember those parentheses because other, to call a method or a function, to call it, you have to use the parentheses. Otherwise, you're just saying, hey, that thing exists. So we'll capitalize it. Give us, so let's read the documentation. Only the first letter is capitalized. Although it says it's deprecated, so we don't really use it that much. Um, so let's see, string functions. And let's see, string services. Come on. Template string, string functions. There's got to be other things that are interesting with strings. I know there are. Yeah, there are in other interesting things with strings, but I don't want to get into them until I know until I teach you about lists. So um, let's see. So, but each of the, but the important thing was that each of these created a new string. It doesn't change the original string that we have, text, right? I run text.capitalize. But it doesn't change. Oh, and yes, you need to spell things correctly. Important. It doesn't change the string. It creates a new string. Okay? Um, let's see. Yeah, that's all I really need to... Ah, here's another thing. Um, now, yes? Sorry? I think you have to spell, spell uh, I think there's cap words, which is a bit different. Um, but there's, you don't, you're never going to use capitalize, as far as I know. I'm not going to put it on an exam. It's just one that, it's just one that exists. Um, other question? I saw another hand. OK. Um, so I'm going to tie this back to Boolean, uh, to Boolean expressions. Python has one more unique Boolean operator that other languages don't have, but it's fairly intuitive. Um, so we're going to do it right now. A in text 
this returns true or false. So is A in text? Is this true or false? Anyone? False. A is not in hello world. How about uh, L in text? It's true. Um, OK, let's move up in a bit of complexity. L in text. Uh, sorry, LL in text. It's true, right? There's two L's in, in hello, right? Let's go ahead and print that out. Oh, um, let's do another one. Um, this one, period, period, in text, true or false, do you think? False, because we're looking literally for period, period. There are two periods in hello, world, but they're not together. That's what we're looking for. So if I were looking for uh, period space in text, that's going to return true. Okay. Um, so basically, it looks for any part, does any part of this string match? It's case sensitive, too. Um, so hello in text, false. Uh, but hello in text, which is the one where we saved it into upper, that will be true because it's case sensitive. Right? So it cares about the difference between uppercase and lowercase. It's pretty nifty. Um, one of the things we can, so also what's nifty is that we can use for loops to, uh, on these things. But I think I'm going to leave that for next Tuesday. Instead, I'll go ahead and introduce us to a list. So you kind of know what a list is just by its name. It's a list of stuff. Formally, it's an ordered collection of data. Okay, It's an ordered collection of data that can be modified. Ordered in that order matters in a list, just like how order matters in a string. right? Order matters in a string. For instance, if uh, we've got our text over here, and if I were to do this, sorted text, or let's see, sort text. That's not what I really... That's, but notice that basically this is gibberish now because I sorted it in order of uh, the appearance of the letters. So yeah, that right order matters in strings. Uh, sim similarly, order ma it's assumed order matters in list, although it doesn't have to. But if the first thing in a list will always be the first thing in the list. Um, lists can are look essentially like this. They look actually a lot like the vector I put up there, just with commas. Uh, 13, 22, 22, potato. And four. That is our list. And I'm going to save it in L. The reason I'm not saving it in something called list is because just like there's a string function, just like, or rather, just like there's an str function, an int function, and a float function, there's a list function where if you throw something into it, well, it'll turn it into a list. But you can't turn one a thing of one. It has to be iterable, which we'll go over what that means on Mon on Tuesday. But essentially, that means you have to be able to use a for loop on it. So I can throw, for instance, I can throw a string into a list. Hello, and it'll create a list of the individual characters. But let's go back to the basics. I've got a, our basic list over here. It's got 13, 22, potato, and 4. Um, the reason I threw in the potato was because I wanted to show you that lists can hold anything. They don't have to just hold numbers. They don't have to just hold strings. They can hold anything. In fact, they can hold any amount of anything. Although you try doing a matrix multiplication with one of your values being potato, and we'll see how far you get with that. Um, so um, this notation, by the way, for going through these things works exactly the same, which is that L of 0 gives me 13. L of 1 gives me 22. L of 3 
gives me 4. L of 2, index 0, 1, 2. That will give me potato. Also, interestingly enough, in this case, L of 2 equal equals L of negative 2. Right? This might be uh, kind of exempl exemplary of a test question I might give on, which is that, hey, hold on, sorry. <coughs> ah, I think that was it. Okay. Right? 0, 1, 2. Negative 2 is negative 1, negative 2. So they're the same item. So um, what's now the big difference between um, the big difference between a list and a string is that lists are mutable. You can change them. So let's do L of two is equal to sweet potato. Notice that that accepted that. That was perfectly fine. And what that did is that that replaced what was at index 2. 13, 22. Index 2 was potato. And I said, take the thing on the right and put it in the variable on the left. It's useful to think of lists as a collection of variables. Variable L0, L1, L2, L3. Why? Well, because sometimes you don't know how, how big your program is uh, going to be. Um, let's go ahead and tie it back to turtles very quickly in the last 10 minutes. So, new. Classroom, ITP 2020, list turtle directions. We're going to be talking plenty more about lists and stuff in, in, this, in the upcoming chapters. Yes? Yep, we will. Append adds it to the end, and I haven't got into it yet because I wanted to. I wanted to stick with getting things out and and putting and you know and putting things um, in there. So, but let's see. Yeah, I think I'm going to stick with that for right now. So, L. But honestly, that's a really good point. So what, um, what your, yes? I have a book. Uh, so why did you change it? Is there a way you can store it like in memory and then just call it like later down the code? In what sense? The potato or the sweet potato? So, so, the, so this changes the sweet potato. Yes. And is there somewhere where you can like store that memory saying it was the uh, first, the first uh, thing I stored uh, that? Yes, but you have to do it manually. So let me go ahead and just kind of do it using sweet potato. If I can say, uh, I can say old, so I can say the old value is L2, right? And then I can say, so that will take what's inside L2 and store it in old value. Now I can take L2 and I can replace it with whatever I want, let's say with three. And now we've got 13, 22, 3, 4 old value and now old value holds sweet potato but that's the only way you can it's not going to hold once you replace something it's not going to remember what used to be on the list it's like you completely erased it with a really good eraser you know so it, it so the only memory it has is the memory you give it mm -hmm. um so now what you were asking about was the append function. So um, not only can you change things with regards to this in a list, you can append things on a list like this. 
l.append5. Notice it didn't output anything because it just changed it. And that adds something to the end of the list. So not only can you change the individual items in a list, but you can add more items to the list. It's possible to insert items in the middle using the insert function, but we'll get to that. Um, also, again, to use potatoes as our example, we can totally, um, let's make a list here called fruits, actually. Fruits is equal to um, apple and banana. Now, the issue with spelling banana is not starting to spell banana, but knowing when to stop spelling banana. Okay, so L plus fruits is actually an operation we can do. Um, and it's an intuitive operation. If we were just using numbers, you might assume that we would be adding the individual numbers, and then we might get into, but these are not matrices, these are not vectors, these are our lists. If you have one list and another list, you're just going to combine them, like so. So that's another, so that, uh, rather than using append, you can just take one list and another list and smack them together like that. Mind you, that created a new list. It didn't change the old list. Just saying that, what would you get if you took one list and another list? You'd get a, both lists together. Um, L minus fruits. Yeah, that's not going to work. It says you can't subtract lists from each other. Uh, L. So you're seeing a lot of similarities between this and strings, right? That was exactly the same way that strings worked. L times. Let's go ahead and do fruits. Unsupported. Can't multiply by non-int of type list. Ooh, saying you can't multiply by a non-int. Fruits times five. Apple, banana, apple, banana, apple, banana, apple, banana, apple, banana. Right? Just simply multiply. That's exactly what happens with strings, right? With strings, if I multiply a string, it replicates it. So here, if I do na 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 times 5, actually if I just do one na times 25, it gives me 25 na's. Right? So our plus operation, and again, you, the, these are super similar to the way uh, strings work. The big difference here is that you can change, is that you can change these but you can't change a string. And also strings only represent text. But strings have their use because so much of our information is text. I mean, if you're gonna make a post on social media about how boring this lecture was, you're gonna do it with a string. Um, so. so I think that's a perfectly fine stopping point for today. Um, I, want, I want to make sure not to overload you with slicing and other stuff because that's what we're going to talk about next. I'll assign readings. It will address slicing. Um, we're going to do some, we'll probably have a quiz on basic uh, array, sorry, on basic list stuff when, on Tuesday. So basically know about how the indices work. So I'll ask you things like, what is indice 2? What is indice negative 1 of this string? Right, those kind of things.